Let us begin for the night because it's past 6.30, so let's go ahead and get started. We only have until 8, and I think we're going to wrap up Buddhism tonight, I think. Now, like I've said about every single religion, all of these can be studied for a lifetime. They are all much more complex than everything I'm bringing to you. What I'm bringing to you is the Cliff Notes version, totally. <laughs> but at least it's beginning your understanding if you haven't been exposed to Buddhism yet. We also have heard that people are following us on YouTube that aren't part of the congregation, and they're very grateful for uh, us getting this out there. So, yay! Hi, everybody out there. Okay, did anybody not get a handout from last week? Or were you all here? No. Raise your hand. Did, did or did not? Okay. Okay, so there are actually several handouts. So one is Buddhism terms. Did you get that? The yes. terms? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody need the Buddhism terms? Okay, and these are not all of the terms, but these are some of the major ones that we're talking about. Some are in the language of Sanskrit. And it will probably tell you which ones are which. Some are in the language of Sanskrit because remember Buddhism came out of um, India. That's where it originated. And uh, in its beginnings had some things in common with Hinduism. And that was many of those terms. Most of those terms in Hinduism are in the language of Sanskrit. But as Buddhism developed, it then started doing some of its earliest writings and further writings in the language of Pali, which is the language of the the, the sort of the common dialect of the people in that er area. And uh, the Buddha wanted the scriptures and, and the, the wisdom that he was teaching to be as understandable as possible to the people. Even though it was complex ideas, he wanted it to be in a language that everybody could understand. Sanskrit was not a language that everybody could understand. So then we also have, so some of them are in Pali. Um, then we also have some papers here that are of practitioners of Buddhism. Who needs those? I, I gave this out last time, so none of them have them? I wasn't here. Okay, okay. Okay, got it. So if you could just take one that says a pure offering every day and one that has a people on it. Okay. They go together. I didn't staple them, but they go together. Okay, so with, it, with all the religions that I'm talking about, since I'm not a practitioner or an expert on these religions other than Christianity, and by the way, nobody is a practitioner of all these religions, um, but I wanted to give you a first-hand account of somebody who lives these religions. So go ahead and read that. And then, this one I know none of you have. Kath asked me to type this out, and so I did. So if you want to take one of those and pass them down. Um, do you remember, those of you who were here last time, we talked about how Buddhism, as well as lots of other religions, have a lot of things that have a lot of numbers, like four this and three that, six this and eight that. Have you noticed this about religions? Yeah, we have. Okay, so Kath asked me if I could type out this, like a list of all of the things that I was talking about last time, like the three marks of existence, the four passing sites, the noble eightfold path, although we haven't gone over that one yet. So if this list is helpful, um, go ahead and grab one of those. Any extras? The, 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 the okay. okay, thank you. All right, so are there any questions about anything we talked about last time or at all? I, I, I've got a question sure. uh, oh, when you say overall. Uh, the question is this, and maybe it was, it was explained to me and I didn't get it or why, okay. but why do the Muslims all have to pray towards Mecca? I mean, with us, our God is everywhere, and we don't really need to pray uh, if there's a cross, you pray towards a cross, but other than that, you don't need to pray. Why do they all have to go and, and pray towards Mecca? Well, Muslims are praying toward a sacred object, actually. It's not just the city where it all began. Uh -huh. it, it is the city where it all began, but it's in a mosque, and there's a particular sacred object called the Kaaba. And it's a big cub cubicle structure that's covered with, with black, uh, black cloth. And 
it's believed to be a place that I, I believe it was thought that Adam built it and then Abraham rebuilt it, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's a sacred structure and there are all kinds of rituals done around there when people go on pilgrimage. Many religions actually have a geographical center, like a one geographical center. So I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, Catholicism, there's the Vatican, and it's just such a, a beautiful yeah, place. Yeah, but I don't pray and, towards the Vatican. Right, it's just not your ritual to do that. But no. other places have, I mean, the religion of Sikhism has a geographical center. Um, the religion of Shinto in Japan has a building that's a geographical center. So it's a very common thing, actually, common to have a place. Towards a shrine where... Right, and, and we, in Christianity, we look, you know, to the sun rising in the east when we have our Easter sunrise services. Um, there were, in, you know, much olden days, um, cathedrals built in certain directions, and so people actually were praying toward... Wasn't there a prayer towards Jerusalem by yes. Jews yes. and Christians yes. alike? Yes, right, right. So, yeah. So, so, it's, so, it's, so it's, not, it's not exclusive It's not just to for Islam. It's, yeah, Absolutely. it's actually pretty common. Okay. But Thank you. Sure, okay. yeah. I'm sorry. No, this no was problem. Way back and I've been, I've been wanting to ask that yeah. question. So any other questions on Buddhism specifically that we've been talking about or anything this has brought up for you? Okay, so we were just to, this is just to go back a little bit. When the Buddha, well, he wasn't called the Buddha at the time. He was Prince Siddhartha or Siddhartha Gautama, sometimes just known as Gautama. When he was sitting under the Bodhi tree, do you remember talking about that, the wisdom tree? He went through different watches of the night, the first watch, second watch, and so forth, where he saw all the reincarnations of his, his own life, his own self, and then all the reincarnations of every living being. And then he uh, was able to transcend all of this. He saw that everybody was just a slave to suffering. There was no part of life that wasn't going to die at some point. And so um, he was able to finally transcend this in his own process of enlightenment where he woke up. And what he woke up to was the nature of the human condition, how to transcend the human condition, and he did transcend it all by looking within. Now it's not thought that he got any help from a god or other kind of being or even one of the ascetics or one of the monks that were around. It's thought that he completely understood the path to enlightenment, became enlightened only by looking within. Okay? So what he discovered during that time, and by the way, this was after he discovered the middle way, so that's one of the most important doctrines of Buddhism is the middle way, that you're not going to want to be either an ascetic and deny yourself entirely of the creature comforts of things like food and water and clothing and shelter, but you also don't want to be indulgent like he was when he was a prince. So he discovered the middle way, but then as he meditated under the Bodhi tree, he discovered the Four Noble Truths. So that was during the last watch of the night, actually through in the deepest middle of the night and into sunrise. He was enlightened when he discovered the Four Noble Truths. So that's where we left off last time that we talked. So, and we're briefly gonna go over this because what we're going to do now or next is we're going to talk about the divisions of Buddhism because we said that to be a Buddhist means to take refuge in the three jewels. And that's written on your list. To take, re that's the language here, to take refuge in the three jewels. Number one is the Buddha himself and when he's awakened to the understanding of life, a deeper understanding of life, he's now known as the Buddha. Because remember, this means the awakened one. And his name is not Buddha. That's a title. He's the Buddha. Okay? So the second jewel is the Dharma, and that just means his teachings. And that's what we've been going over for at least a week, not a little bit more. And then the third jewel that one must take refuge in if they're going to be considered a Buddhist is the Sangha. And the Sangha just means the community. The community of um, the, the, the religious, meaning the monks and the nuns, and the laity. Are you familiar with that term, laity? It's like you are a laity. Yes. If you're not clergy, you're laity. Right. So sometimes we say you're a lay person but the plural of that is laity. 
Okay, so the, the, the two types of folks understood in the Sangha are the religious, <coughs> meaning the monks and nuns, and the laity. So when all of them together c comprise the Sangha, it's the community of the believers and the doers of what Buddhism is. Okay, so the Four Noble Truths, then. Um, number one, and I think we left off last time talking about this. Number one is, it can be translated a little differently. Either to live is to suffer, or life is suffering. So the first noble truth is about suffering, and that Pali term is dukkha, so life is dukkha, or life is suffering. And that might sound really negative, because we might say, well, life is also joyful and good and loving, and the Buddhists would say, of course it is, but we're not diagnosing the problem by saying life is good and joyful. It's like if you went to a doctor with chronic headaches, and you said, this is bothering me, chronic headaches, and the doctor said, yeah, but how's your stomach doing? Pretty well, right? And you'd be like, yes, but that's not relevant to this conversation. I get it, the stomach's great, the legs are working fine, I got good elbows, you know? But I want to diagnose the problem, and that's my headaches. And so that's what the Buddha and Buddhists do. They diagnose the problem. Not that life is all problematic, but let's look at the problem and figure that part out. And that, in fact, not only is what Buddhists do, but it's what religions do when religions talk about this A that I'm always going on and on about, the human condition. You know, and then how to get beyond it into something better. Yeah. And we might say, well, but there's a lot of good about the human condition. <laughs> yes, there is, but why isn't it 100% perfect? Yes, we get it, your stomach is great, but what about the headaches? How do we deal with that? And so every religion has an understanding of what's going on that it's not perfect. In Christianity, it's sin. But in other religions, it's other things. And so anyway, the first noble truth is diagnosing the problem, or the, rather the effect, not so much the cause, but the effect. Life is suffering. Now the second of the noble truths is the cause. What causes suffering? And the cause is, the Pali word is tanha, which means desire, but it's not a desire to benefit others. It's more like selfish desire. You know, if you desire to be enlightened, that's a good desire. If you desire to feed the poor, that's a good desire. But it's more, it's more really like what Christians would call sin. You know, it's desire just for the self, more like the ego. And remember, according to Buddhism, there really isn't a solid, stable self. So you're dumping all your resources and all your energy and all your concern and all your time and everything into this thing that doesn't even really exist. So, you know, if, if you think, I mean, the, the reason we do almost pretty much everything is because we want to be happy, right? We change jobs or we change relationships or we move to a new town, we buy a new house, we sell a house, whatever <coughs> we do, we do it because we want to be happy. And you know, Dr. Phil on TV, he always has that great question, well, how's that working out for you? Are you 100% happy yet? Nobody is 100% happy yet. Even though 20 years ago you had all these goals, as soon as I do X, Y, and Z, as soon as I get married or have a baby or move to this place or get this job, and, and yet, you know, maybe you're glad you accomplished those goals, but nobody is 100% happy. Now, the reason why is because we think we have this self, this ego, and as soon as we meet all the self's needs, we will be done. But according to Buddhism, this self is more like this endless black hole. Because we're always changing, you're always wanting new goals, just as soon as you get something met, whether it's education or a relationship or whatever, you, you and I and everybody, we humans, we're on to the next thing. So it's this endless like dumping of things into the self and we're still not happy. And we might say, yeah, but if I had as much money as Bill Gates or if I was as famous as Kim Kardashian or if I was as powerful as the Queen of England or whatever it is, then I would be happy. But if we interviewed those people, we are certain none of them are 100% happy. They might be happy about some things, but not 100%. It's human nature not to be. And so, that's what's going on. I read this to you last time, I believe, from a, um, from a poet. 
named Wei Wu Wei. He puts it like this. Why are you unhappy? Because 99.9% .9 of everything you think and of everything you do is for yourself and there isn't one. So instead of constantly going down that same road of pouring more and more goals in, more and more achievements in, now that we know after however many decades we've lived, it doesn't work, maybe we can take a new direction and do something different. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so part of what's going on in this desire is our incessant need for attachments. And we went over this a bit last time too. We form attachments. And even if the Buddha or I or anybody said we shouldn't form attachments, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It's not like we can tell each other not to do this. It's that we do this, and it's just good to know. We do this. We even want to do this. We form attachments knowingly, willingly, with people, with situations, with jobs, with weather, with you know, where we live, with uh, whatever, political structures, any that we form so many attachments. And yet, do you remember the three marks of existence when we said that there's no self and there's no permanence, and the third mark of existence is suffering. Well, there's no permanence. So we form an attachment, and yet because there's no permanence, the attachment gets taken out of our hands, or it changes, or some such thing happens. Our kids grow up, our relationships change, our bodies change, our minds change, we cannot grasp. It's like, it's like grasping really tightly to water. And it's going to sink out of our hands. So we have these attachments and we have a desire for more and more and more and more. We develop greater and greater and greater and greater attachments. And we cause more and more of our own suffering going down this vicious cycle that doesn't work. So the third noble truth is that suffering can be brought to cessation. Suffering can be stopped. So I'm just gonna write here cessation. You can end suffering, and that's really exciting. It's not just that, dang, we have to suffer forever, but there are things you can do to end suffering. And so the fourth noble truth is the solution, is how you can do this, and that's called the Eightfold Path. Sometimes the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, there's all these fours and eights and threes and <laughs> lists. That's why I typed it up. Okay, the Noble Eightfold Path. So before we get to the Eightfold Path, do you agree that life is suffering or that there is suffering in life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and I mentioned this last time that there are a few reasons why or a few uh, explanations as to this. First of all, we're always encountering unpleasant things. We're always being taken away from pleasant things, and we all have things that we want that haven't come to pass yet. So in Buddhism, that's called uh, harboring unfulfilled wishes. You know, we want things that haven't happened yet. We are eternally expanding creatures. We want more and more and more, and that's not always a bad thing. I mean, we say to our kids, you know, you shouldn't want more and more and more toys, and yet we as adults, we want more and more too. Maybe not even physical objects, but we want more experiences or more relationships or we want to lose that last 10 pounds or whatever it is. We want something else. And so we encounter unpleasant things, we're separated from pleasant things, and we all have these unfulfilled wishes. And so there's that, the diagnosis of the disease that the Buddha does, life is suffering, and it's because we have these, this, this constant thirst and desire, selfish desire to, to better ourselves, to have more experiences. We're so, we're so self-important, you know, and that only brings suffering. So, it sounds like a pessimistic religion, doesn't it? It, it does. Kind of like a bummer of a religion, right? Well, I, I have a question. Is it because over in India, uh, I work with doctors from India that were educated to come over here and so on, and they own factories over there and so on, and they say there is no help for the helpless. Mm. That 
there's just so many people and so few jobs mm. and so few food mm. and stuff and they say there is no help for the helpless. I don't it, know. Do you think it was back then I, I, that they felt that there was so much uh, suffering, suffering because, you know what I mean? I, I, I really don't, and, and I could be wrong, but I think it's because these are timeless truths, universal truths. I think that these are things, I mean, I think with all of these religions, they've stayed over thousands of years because they have something to offer to humanity that isn't well, just about be. that isn't just about thousands of years hope. ago in one place well and because we relate yeah. i mean we're not living 2500 years ago in india and yet we relate yeah right mm -hmm. and religions that stay talk to the psyche or the soul of all of us they're not about things that are i mean some things have fallen away like some religions that did human sacrifice, Aztec, for instance, we so don't relate to that, yeah. at least right here in this, but we don't do that. Right. So I don't see a whole lot of Aztecs walking around. But religions we relate to on any level, they seem to stay. They seem to connect. Um, they make sense, even though we are miles away from where it started and thousands of years away. I mean, I always say this, even the Roman Empire fell. So many things have come and gone. And we think, you know, who wins the Super Bowl this year is so important, and who wins the Olympics Not the next day. time, and who wins the Academy Awards. We think that's so important, and yet, will people be talking about that 2,500 years from now? I doubt it. I mean, I, maybe, who knows, no. but I, I doubt it. But people are talking now about things that came up thousands of years ago, because they relate to all of us so well. That's why I love these religions, not because I practice all of them, because you know I don't, but because I love psychology and spirituality, and I look at this stuff and go, yeah, I can learn from this. This stuff doesn't contradict Christianity. It's just very psychologically astute. And I read it and go, wow, how does the Buddha know how I feel in the 21st century as a woman in America all these years later on? You know, it's because these are timeless universal truths. So, um, I'm going to say something else about India, but I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, the other thing. I think that it, I think that this really, at least according to the stories, really came about as a big deal to Gautama because he was isolated from knowing about sickness, old age, and death. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. He was kept away from knowing any of this stuff. And so he wasn't desensitized to it. For good or for bad, he wasn't. And so when he was older, 28, 29, that was when he saw all this stuff for the first time. Can you imagine not knowing about old age, disease, and death? I mean bad disease, not like having a cold. Um, until you were in your 20s and how that would hit you like a ton of bricks. So that's when he just was determined to try to figure out, okay, how am I going to even cope? You know, he, I mean, it was just this huge shell shock he went through, according to these stories anyway. Okay, so back to what I was saying. It sounds, it sounds by looking at all this that Buddhism is a very pessimistic religion. And yet, when you are around Buddhists, and I don't mean to be stereotypical here, and I apologize if this offends anybody, but the Buddhists I've known have been incredibly peaceful, happy, smiling, not sitting in a corner weeping because life is suffering. It's because they're looking at this, then they know how to deal with that. So one of my huge heroes of all times, I don't know him personally, is the Dalai Lama. And do you know who the Dalai Lama is? He's the main Lama, the main spiritual leader and clergy of the Tibetan Buddhists that are right now exiled out of Tibet, and there's all that going on. So he has seen massive suffering. He has seen bloodshed, he has seen genocide, he has seen his friends imprisoned. He was made the Dalai Lama without stepping up to want to do it as a career choice. It was told, you are the incarnation of the Bodhisattva a saint, and you are the Dalai Lama. I mean, the, the life this man has lived has been uh, it, it would blow anybody's mind the amount of suffering he's gone through and witnessed in his community. And yet, he is one of the most joyful, 
happy people. Have you ever read any of his books or seen his talks or anything? He, what he does, he, he wrote a really good book with um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu called The Art of Joy. And um, in it, he talks about, yeah, you can listen to it like on Audible. I listened to it, I think it was on Audible. It's called, okay, here's what's called The Book of Joy. Sorry, The Book of Joy. He wrote another one called The Art of Happiness. So I'm confusing the two. The Art of Happiness, but the one that I really love is The Book of Joy. And then the subtitle is Lasting Happiness in a Changing World. He and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is one of the main people who work with Nelson Mandela to get apartheid out of the way in South Africa, um, they both have seen massive amounts of suffering, obviously. But they both talk about the importance of joy. And you would go, how are they joyful with all that they've seen and lived through? What they do is they list the impediments to joy. Envy, cynicism, despair, um, laziness, you know, whatever. They, they list these impediments. <laughs> suffering, like ways you can suffer, and then how they deal with each one of them. So if you're feeling envious, here's some things you can do that might help you, or things to remember that might help you. If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling angry, if you're feeling whatever the impediments, because they have this understanding, joy will flow if you don't stop it. But we stop it all the time. And so it would seem like Buddhism is a very pessimistic religion talking about suffering, but that's like if a doctor is trying to understand your chronic headaches and saying, okay, here's the reasons why, and here's the prescription, and here's what can help. You're, you're, you're focusing on the problem in order to solve it and get it out of the way. So anyway, I really recommend you read some of the Dalai Lama's uh, writings. Um, he was supposed to be at the Parliament of the World's Religions when I went in 2015, and he was sick, so he couldn't come, but I was really bummed about that. But they um, Skyped him in, and we heard him speak, and he's smiling and happy and just an amazing person. Yeah. So, is the, the title Dalai Lama, is that like the Pope? I mean, there's always a Dalai Lama? There's always a Dalai Lama. And yes. they're different people, and they think they're a reincarnation of the... Of a particular saint named Kuan Yin. Yeah. Yeah, it's... The saint is... Um, uh, this is interesting, I think. It's a female sometimes spelled Kuan Yin. And if you go to the Buddhist temple in Hasina Heights, when you see a woman who looks like a Chinese equivalent of the Virgin Mary, and she's often pouring out a, um, like she's holding a little vase and pouring out what's known as the oil of compassion. She is a, almost like a goddess, but she's not really known as a goddess. She's known as a saint or it was called a bodhisattva, but a saint of compassion. But the interesting thing is that she's female, but she came from, I mean, the, the religion traveled from India up to China. And in India, she is a he. And I don't know if I'm spelling this right, Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara. I know that's how to pronounce it, I'm not quite sure if that's the spelling. Anyway the same person, but in India, male, and in China, female. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> so anyway, the Dalai Lama is thought to be the reincarnation, and all the Dalai Lamas have thought to be the reincarnation of him, her, this person, the uh, saint of compassion. So, anyway. And when he dies, there will be another one, a child, you know, they will find. So. And, they, and they have all these um, weights to find if that's the child. They bring objects to the child's home. They bring a, a bunch of objects that belonged to the Dalai Lama, and they br bring a bunch of other objects that didn't. And they say, which are, which are your objects? And the, one, the Dalai Lamas reach for the correct ones. Isn't that weird? Crazy stuff. <laughs> anyway, okay. So it would seem to be pessimistic, but when you're around Buddhists, um, that's just not the, that's not the oppression Buddhists give. I was at a Upland uh, interfaith council meeting about a week ago, a couple weeks ago, 
And uh, there were five or six of us in the room, and we were all of different faiths, and one of them was a Buddhist nun. And she was the quietest one in the room, but she looked just beatifically peaceful the entire time. And there was actually kind of a heated discussion, kind of a controversial discussion. Uh, and people were getting a little bit like, oh, a little bit kind of like the energy was going up. And she was just sort of sitting there beaming, like in perfect tranquility the entire time. So that's how, that's generally how I've known Buddhists, just very calm. So again, I, I'm sure I'm stereotyping here. Not all Buddhists are like this, but, but I wouldn't call it a pessimistic religion at all. Okay, so the last of the Four Noble Truths is the Eightfold Path. This is what the Buddha discovered by looking within that was the solution to suffering caused by desire, selfish desire. So um, I think that the, it's on, the list is on there, right? Okay, so let's talk about that. Okay, so the first one is right views. All, all of these are right, like correct, you know, correct views. So, okay, so in this one, the, the Buddhist is expected or encouraged to understand the Buddhist teachings, particularly the Four Noble Truths. The second is right intentions, and that is to develop the moral attitudes, to go away from attitudes of hatred or delusion or ignorance and develop the right attitudes or intentions of generosity, kindness, friendship, insight, all that. Do you remember when we talked about how morality in Buddhism has to do with your intention, not the outcome? So one of the precepts for all Buddhists is to not take any life. So we were saying that if somebody accidentally hit a deer, even though the deer died, like if they were driving, and if the deer died, but that wasn't the intention, then the person wouldn't gain bad karma from it. But if a person tried to shoot a deer, and the deer ran away, or the person missed shooting or whatever, the person would gain bad karma from it. Because the intention is what matters, not the outcome. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the second of the four noble, or the eightfold path, uh, right intentions. To have the correct intention of trying to do you know, good. Okay, the ne those, those, two, those two of the eight, Eightfold Path have to do with wisdom. Just knowledge and wisdom, in head stuff. The next three have to do with morality, in terms of specific actions that you do in your life. And that starts with number three, right speech. So be careful of what you say, which I, I mean, yes, and amen, and I would suggest this too. Watch your words. Words create worlds. I mean, we look at the Holocaust. It didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of words. And words create empires and destroy them and create people and destroy them. And words are important. So Buddhists are told to avoid things like gossip, lying, abusive words, rumors, and even idle talk. Make sure that your words are constructive. Or don't say them. <laughs> if you have nothing to say, don't say it. Okay, the next one, number four, is right conduct. And it's obeying all these precepts, the five precepts for all Buddhists, and then there are five more. Remember we talked about how there were ten for the monks and the nuns. So that's similar, isn't it, to our Ten Commandments. Okay, so doing the, the precepts. Now, the, the, the next one I find really fascinating. Number five, right livelihood. It basically says this, hey, if you want to be a Buddhist, if you want to follow the precepts, then do it all the time, including in your job. Doesn't that make sense? Instead of just saying, I'm going to subscribe to this spiritual path on Sunday morning, and then I'm going to go do something else on Monday morning, you know, just make them consistent. So, for instance, one of the um, precepts is to not take life, and another one is to not drink intoxicants. Do you remember that? So then your livelihood has to reflect this, and you shouldn't take life or help any others take life. So a Buddhist should not um, sell any weapons. They should not, um, let's see, here's my list. Um, they cannot be a soldier. Now, are, are some Buddhist soldiers? Of course. 
but this is the ideal. So they are not supposed to uh, sell weapons. Um, they are not supposed to sell liquor. Because even if they're not drinking it, they shouldn't be making other or helping out other people doing it if that's one of their precepts. Um, they're not supposed to be a butcher. They're not supposed to be a hunter or a soldier. Or see how they, they say like your job should not in any way participate in any of those things that you want to uphold in your spiritual life. Makes sense. Okay. Six, seven, and eight move on into areas of concentration. So from wisdom to morality to concentration. So number six is right effort. And that is maintaining mental alertness as opposed to letting your senses get dulled. So, you know the feeling, I'm sure. I, I have that feeling too sometimes where we're not very sharp. Sometimes when we try to multitask, then we can't really focus on anything. Um, if we're on our cell phone as we're talking to our kids, we're not really there and participating. And we, we're doing things that are kind of dulling our senses. Certain things we eat, certainly drinking intoxicants could dull our senses. So this is one of the things that Buddhists are expected to do because it helps with concentration. And the end goal of all of this is to be able to fully concentrate. So begin by trying to figure out what dulls your senses and what sharpens your senses. Get enough sleep, eat good food, you know, maintain concentration like that. Moving next into the next uh, uh, of the Eightfold Path is right mindfulness, number seven. Mindfulness means being totally aware of what you're doing when you're doing it. Have you ever driven on a freeway and you're like, I don't remember the last 20 minutes on this freeway? We go into what scholar or researchers call a fugue. A fugue is like a temporary trance in a way as we're driving through traffic and whatnot. I go walking almost every day around my house for half an hour to an hour. And the other day I came home and I couldn't remember walking home. I was like, whoa, that is just weird. You ever had that? You know, I was listening to a podcast, and so my focus was fully on that. So I guess I was mindful about that, but I was not mindful about what I was doing. And that's kind of strange. Now, the reason that Buddhists are asked to practice mindfulness, whether they're washing the dishes, talking to a child, whatever, just totally do that one thing. The reason they're asked to practice mindfulness is because it helps in meditation. And you're going to get there in number eight, right meditation. Now, if you've practiced these other things about concentration, then your meditation will be easier to do. If you're used to telling yourself you can multitask, by the way, have you seen studies that that's not true, that people multitask? We think that we do, but we really don't. What happens to our brain if we're trying to multitask is the brain shifts back and forth between what we're doing. It doesn't really multi, like you can't pay attention. They, they have these studies of like kids walking around college campuses looking at their cell phones, and then they have a full on dressed up clown walk right by the kids. Then they ask later, did you notice the clown? And they don't, they don't see the clown. This is why we get, it. we get into accidents when we're texting, because we think we can multitask, and we can't. So we think, oh, I'll just shoot a little text to my friend and I'll be able to tell if traffic's moving or whatever. We can't do it. We, we believe we have more confidence in our ability to do that than we should. So the brain then is just shifting back and forth between events. So if we develop instead right effort so we know we can stay alert um, and discriminate between wise and unwise activity for our senses and have good food and good sleep and whatever we need to do to be able to concentrate, and if we practice mindfulness, only doing one thing at a time, then when we get to meditation, we'll be able to have much more clarity of focus. It's hard enough. I know some of you meditate, right? Jack, you've done yes. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I meditate too. Do any of the rest of you ever do that? I can't meditate. It's tough. It ta it's like roping it. It's like herding cats, you know? And, and you, you find your mind going down this way, and you go, no. Come on back, and then it goes down this way. Come on, back. it's a constant, constant. Come on back, come on back. Now, from my experience, I, the rewards are huge, 
huge. So I do this all the time because it's yeah, I see the benefit of it. But the rewards actually are in the last like for me the last like five minutes of my twenty minutes of sitting there because for the first fifteen my brain is all over the place. So when we then in our non-meditative state practice mindfulness, then it's a little bit easier to know how to train the mind while in meditation to stay on one thing, whether it's focusing on your breath, listening to the air conditioner, looking at the flame of a candle, whatever it is that you're using to help you meditate, you're more focused on just one thing rather than thinking you could do five things or even two things. Make sense? Okay, so the last then, number eight, of this eightfold path is right meditation. And when the Buddha described it, he described um, going into different stages of meditation. And, and that's really how it feels when you meditate, at least for me. It, it feels like going almost down into like a basement and then down further and then down further. Does that feel like that to yes. you, Josh? Like you started this place and then you just, it's like descending and descending and descending. And then it gets easier the further down you go. It gets easier to stay there and to, and to concentrate. Um, up here it's just chaotic. <laughs> um, but that's what the Buddha talked about, descending into different stages. And the Buddha's explanation is that then you will achieve enlightenment. Now, what is enlightenment? I have no idea. I don't know if I've achieved it, if Jack's achieved it, if all of you have achieved it. I don't know. Um, according to the Buddha, though, well, different people have different beliefs about this, but generally, according to the Buddha, once you've achieved it, you're done. Like, you're always going to be enlightened. My feeling is that my sense of, in my very Christian language, I think of alignment with God. And I feel like I come and go all the time, in and out. And some Buddhists believe that even about enlightenment. That enlightenment is like waking up to the truth of things, but that you don't necessarily stay there. You can go in and out of that. Some Buddhists believe that. So you get, you get a, di a different, um, different explanation on that. But according to uh, traditional Buddhism anyway, once you're enlightened, then that's it. You're done. And so with the Buddha, he came out of his meditation, but fully enlightened. It's kind of like once you've seen it, you've seen it. You know, once you get a glimpse, you get a glimpse, right? And so um, he didn't need to then any longer go through samsara, the wheel of, of birth and rebirth and, and death and rebirth. Um, he, was, he was able to then achieve nirvana when he died. So that is the height of Buddhism. It's not about information. It's about doing what he did. And so all of this that we're talking about is not really Buddhism. All of this is like the path to get there. But to be a Buddhist, you have to meditate. In Christianity, it's often talked about as like an option, you know, something that might help. Um, because I never talk about anything as a requirement, because nothing is. I mean, we're given grace by God, and so there really is no requirement. But in Buddhism, it's like, you want to be a Buddhist? Do it. It's about doing it. And what you do is you don't you don't do uh, you know 27 Hail Marys or you don't go to mass or you don't go to you don't go to classes or you don't, what you do is you meditate. That's that's it. And so everything else is just talking around Buddhism until you actually do it. Okay. Any questions so far? We have more to talk about, but does this all make sense? Sort of as much as it can before you actually are doing. It? Okay. <laughs> okay. So when a person does this. Then the understanding is that when they're enlightened, they have the exact same enlightenment that the Buddha had. But I think I might have said this to you before, they are not called a Buddha because that's a special title reserved for someone who achieves enlightenment on their own with no help from anybody else. The first one in each go-around cycle of the universe. Okay, do you remember how we said that there have been countless Buddhas before, and there will be countless Buddhas? Okay, the, the title Buddha, the Buddha, is only for the, the first one in that cycle of that universe. So other people, mi millions perhaps, have also achieved enlightenment, and they are called arhats, which means saints. They are saints. But they too um, will attain nirvana at the end of their life as well. Is that anybody that achieve anybody that achieves yes. enlightenment is called an arhat. arhat? Yes, yes. Which literally means saints. 
Is, do you think they are the ones that glow? Can that can glow? Well, or have that. That you can yeah, do, that you can see that. from a mile away. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Okay, I'm going to read you a little story from the hungry tigress. Once, long, long ago, the Buddha came to life. Remember, lots of reincarnations. As a noble prince named Mahasattva, in a land where the country of Nepal exists today. One day, when he was grown, he went walking in a wild forest with his two older brothers. The land was dry and the leaves brittle. The sky seemed alight with flames. Suddenly, they saw a tigress. The brothers turned to flee, but the tigress stumbled and fell. She was starving, and her cubs were starving too. She eyed her cubs miserably, and in that dark glance, the prince sensed her long months of hunger and pain. He saw too that unless she found food soon, she might even be driven to devour her own cubs. He was moved to compassion by the extreme hardness of their lives. What, after all, is this life for, he thought. Stepping forward, he calmly removed his outer garments and lay down before her. He tore his skin with a stone and let the starving tigress smell the blood. Mahasattva's brothers fled. Hungrily, the tigress devoured the prince's body and chewed the bones. She and her cubs lived on, and for many years, the forest was filled with a golden light. Centuries later, a mighty king raised a pillar of carved stone on this spot, and pilgrims still go there to make offerings even today. Deeds of compassion live forever. Isn't that a beautiful story? I mean, not one you want to actually personally experience, <laughs> but you know, and so one thing that ta that's talked about about the Buddha is his compassion. So it's not just his wisdom that's admired, but also his compassion. So, um, the um, divisions of Buddhism then. There are three major divisions of Buddhism other than Zen Buddhism, which is very Japanese, and we will talk about that later because it's so different. But three major divisions of Buddhism. So the first one's called Theravada. Theravada. <laughs> Theravada Buddhism. The second is Mahayana. And the third is Vajrayana. Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. Theravada literally means the way of the elders. And this is the form of Buddhism. And most of them are, are formed according to geographical region. This is the form of Buddhism that is the most popular in Sri Lanka, in uh, Myanmar, which is formerly Burma, in Thailand, and Kampuchea, formerly Cambodia. This form of Buddhism is actually atheistic, it's not believing in any kind of a god at all. And it's interesting, I know, to Western people to hear that a religion can be atheistic. Like, why would that even be called a religion? Well, because in so many ways, it has family resemblance with what religion is. I mean, they have sacred sites, and they have texts, and they have rituals, and um, just all kinds of things that look very religious. But it's not a common feature across the world that to be religious means to believe in a god. So Theravada Buddhists, what's most important is the Buddha's wisdom, that he was enlightened, and he became enlightened by willing his consciousness inward, looking inward through meditation. And the ideal human being is an arhat, a saint, who also became enlightened. So Theravada Buddhists believe that the Buddha is totally far away from them, inaccessible. You can't talk to the Buddha. You can't pray to the Buddha. The Buddha is wherever or whatever nirvana is, even if that means extinguishing, because remember, nirvana literally means extinguishing or blowing out like a candle. And the Buddha specifically refused to answer 
whether or not a person will be there to experience nirvana. Because all desire is supposed to be stopped, including the desire for continued existence. And so the Buddha never says what exactly nirvana is like. But the Buddha is gone. So what the Buddha did, though, is leave behind his wisdom all the teachings that he talked about, you know, they, they have sacred scriptures, and arhats that followed, and people that are enlightened. And so if you go to a Theravada Buddhist uh, temple, and you can find them, in fact, there are even some around here, I, know, I think there was one in Orange County, it's a subdued place, and you'll find people meditating. And that's what it is. Okay, now, Mahayana Buddhism. So Theravada means way of the elders. And that's seen as a, it's like, in a way that's like saying we're better, we're best, we're the way of the elders, like we're the original, you know, we're the true Buddhist. Well, Mahayana literally means um, the great raft or the great vehicle. This word yana means raft or vehicle. And the analogy here is like crossing over a river. So if you have a river here, and, and on one side you have samsara, like this world that we're in, and on the other side you have nirvana, and so you need the help of a raft or a vehicle to cross over to the other side. So Mahayana is called the greater vehicle, and Mahayana Buddhists call Theravada Buddhists Hinayana, which means the lesser vehicle. Obviously, they don't call themselves the lesser vehicle. That sounds like a put down because it is. They call themselves the way of the elders. But anyway, Mahayana is the greater vehicle, and not only is it greater in terms of more numbers of people are Mahayana Buddhists, but it's also like it's known as the vehicle for the masses because it's easier. It's easier to achieve enlightenment. Some of the interesting things about Mahayana Buddhism, and this is what's common, by the way, in China in Korea. Um, in Japan, it's modified. It's a little bit different in Japan. Um, Shilai Temple, when we go to Shilai Temple in July, hopefully I have another phone call into them, so I'm hoping July 27th will work out. So when we go to Shilai Temple, that is a Mahayana Temple. And that looks really different than a Theravada Temple because that looks more religious. You'll see people not just meditating, but bowing in front of statues of the Buddha and putting out incense and, and cl clanging gongs and chanting, those things that look outwardly more religious. That's Mahayana Buddhism. So Mahayana Buddhists, what they value the most from the Buddha is not his wisdom, but his compassion. That's seen as the most important thing about the Buddha. That not only are there all these stories of how he was compassionate, like how he laid down in front of the tiger, but he chose to remain in this earth even after he was enlightened. He didn't have to, but he stayed to help the people out of a sense of compassion. The ideal person in Mahayana Buddhism is called a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is one word, but it's made up of two words. Bodhi means wisdom, and sattva means savior. It's related to a word for like salvation. The Bodhisattva is believed to be a saint, um, enlightened, just like an arhat would be. But Bodhisattvas are understood a little bit differently because it is believed that the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas are not gone from us. There's a saying the Bodhisattvas said. Um, and not until every blade of grass is enlightened will we achieve nirvana. Like, we're not going to go yet until we all go with us, that kind of thing. Out of their compassion, they're hanging around. Almost like how we might talk about angels or like our, our loved ones that might be around us. Rather than totally inaccessible, far away, off in nirvana somewhere, we have no idea what's going on. This thought is that they, and it could be millions of them, we don't know, but they, along with the Buddha, are right around here. So when you go to Shilai Temple, if you go, there's a room that has little shelves all over the room, little cubicle shelves with little, they look like little Buddhas, all over everywhere. 
they represent all the bodhisattvas, not the Buddha, but all the bodhisattvas that are all around us helping us. Now they help us in a variety of ways. They are like how we might talk about angels, you know, stopping traffic accidents, showing us the way, whispering in our ear, like our conscience, our guide, that kind of thing. But also, what's that sound? Oh, is your baby crying? <laughs> it's also um, it's also thought that the Buddha, uh, we can pray to him for mercy and grace. Not that he's God, but he has an unlimited store of good karma. So Buddhists care a lot about the karma that they have because that will influence their next life. And they also care about things that we would care about, like health and family and work and things like that. And so they ask the Buddha for help. So when you go to Shilai Temple, if you do, you'll see people, you know, bowing in front of this big statue of the Buddha. And you might think, do they think the Buddha is God? Well, kind of, not really, kind of. The creator of the universe? No, no. He was just a guy. He was a man. That's it. There is an understanding of all these gods and goddesses kind of floating all over the place, but that's not what's important. What's important is your own personal enlightenment. So he was a guy, and yet, because he's enlightened, he can give us grace from his unlimited store of good karma. So it's kind of godlike in a way. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay? So the goal is to recognize our own, what's called our own Buddha nature. That might be like how we would call like our, um, our truest selves, our best selves, our, our soul. But Buddhists wouldn't say the word soul. There is no soul. But we have a nature. It's like a movement, not a thing. So our goal is to recognize our own Buddha nature. And we do it through meditating. We do it through asking the Buddha to help us. We might light incense. Incense is used around the world in many religions as like an offering of prayer. You know, I think as the, how the smoke rises up, so to our prayers rise up with it. You know, so, um, but there's all kinds of rituals around that to honor the Buddha. Is he God? No. Is he God-like? Yeah. In Mahayana Buddhism, not in Theravada Buddhism. Make sense? Following? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. so if you only have the chance to go to one temple, a Mahayana or a Theravada temple, I would suggest the Mahayana. It's a lot more ornate, stuff's going on, you'll see people doing religious things, it's beautiful, it's peaceful. Theravada, super low-key. You're just going to see some monks in their own private meditation, probably. How do you spell the name of the one that you said that we're going to? Shilai Temple, it's spelled like this. H-S-I. It's oh, pronounced well, she, where is it? Hacienda Heights. Oh. <laughs> it means coming to the West. And they came from Taiwan, I believe. Um, and they came to educate the West about Buddhism. I think I told you that those the two big religions that are all into spreading the good news are Christianity and Buddhism. Um, but you're not going to, there's, you're not going to be like heavy handed, you know, proselytized or whatever when you go at all. These are, they're very used to people visiting and they just want to share. So it's very, it's very low key, but you you will love it. I am telling you, I'm telling you, it's amazing. It's $9 for a tour and we'll talk to some guests. I mean, we're the guests, but I mean, <laughs> we'll talk to people who are there and who are hosting us um, and we'll get lunch, all of that for nine bucks. So a good lunch too, vegetarian, but good lunch. So Shilai Temple, Hacienda Heights. I suggest you Google it and check out the pictures. It's beautiful. Okay, the last type of Buddhism is Vajrayana Buddhism. <laughs> and this is, um, the, uh, this is no, these are known as the Tibetan Buddhists. This is what we would call the Tibetan Buddhists, Vajrayana Buddhism. And they're no longer able to be in Tibet because that land has been intercepted by People's Republic of China. So many of them are in India and have really struggled and have gone through a lot. And, and the world has known about their plight, you know, and, and maybe wouldn't have known if they hadn't gone through so much. Um, so let me take my notes about this one. Vajrayana Diamond Raft, that's right. 
So Vajra means diamond. And this is thought to be a very difficult way of being, to be a Tibetan Buddhist or a Vajrayana Buddhist. The difference in Vajrayana Buddhism, and there's a lot of focus on compassion in, in this one too. I mean, Dalai Lama talks about compassion all the time. Um, but the difference in here is that traditional Buddhism, the, these Buddhisms, talk about shutting down or quieting down the senses in order to gain some kind of enlightenment. So when you're meditating, you close down the sense of sight, hearing, you know, you're still with your body, you, know, you, kind of, you kind of close down. And Vajrayana Buddhists take a very different approach. Vajrayana Buddhists say, let's harness the senses. Let's use the senses for purposes of meditation in order to gain greater wisdom, greater knowledge. So one thing that Vajrayana Buddhists do is they utilize something called mandalas. And the West has learned about this. Does this do you know this word, mandalas? They're, they're generally circular patterns, pretty geometrical and, and symmetrical. And um, they're beautiful patterns and designs. And Tibetan Buddhists make these. I saw them make one at the Parliament of the World Religions a few years ago, um, making them out of sand. And it takes hours and hours and hours to create these incredible mandalas. And then when they're done, uh, they move their hand through it and kind of destroy it because everything's impermanent. But it's believed to be very blessed and, and a sacred thing. Mandalas are also painted on these big tapestry-like things called tankas. And then a ceremony is done where the Buddha's spirit is asked to uh, embody the tanka. So there's a commonality with our bread and wine in communion where we believe that it's not any longer just bread and wine, but also the very body and blood of Christ. We believe that in the whole ritual, there's not a moment, but in the whole ritual of communion, that God embodies the object. Okay, so when you receive communion, you're receiving the literal you know, bread and wine. Now, not every denomination believes that, but Lutherans do. So in a similar, obviously there's, there's differences, but in a similar way, this isn't just a sacred object, this tanka, this mandala, to remind people of the Buddha, but rather the Buddha's very spirit is asked to be in it. So the object then becomes sacred as it embodies. The spirit's in the mandala? Yes. What's the tanka? A tanka is the, it's like a big cloth or a big painting that's hung. And, the, and a mandala is painted on it. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. And when you were at Bowers Museum, they had some there. Did you go to Bowers? Some of you did. Mm -hmm. Do you remember seeing any of the Tibetan mandalas? Maybe not. Okay. Well, you'll see I'll some of them at the. I just don't remember. You'll see some of them at <laughs> Shilai Temple. I believe some were there as well. Another thing that um, Tibetans do is they use mantras. Mantras are sayings or songs or chants said over and over and over. So here the mandalas, it's not set, shutting down the sense of sight. People are either painting mandalas, making them with sand, or they're just gazing at mandalas. So that takes the sense of sight. Instead of closing your eyes as you're meditating, you're using your vision as you're meditating. And in mantras, you're using uh, hearing. Tibetan Buddhists, it's amazing, they can chant an entire, I believe it's a chord. Is that what it's called? A chord? How many notes are in a chord? Is it three? Any musical people here? Anyway, they, I, it they, do, they do, they chant an entire chord within their own mm -hmm. selves. So you can hear when they're chanting, I think it's three distinct notes. It's thought to be totally physically impossible to do, and yet they do it. Isn't that amazing? That is. Houston Smith, who wrote that book that I've uh, suggested that you read called The World's Religions, he went and uh, he worked at MIT at the time. He was a professor. And he told uh, his colleagues, you know, I'm going to see these Tibetan Buddhists and this is what they're doing. And they said, we don't believe you. It's not possible. You can't do this. And he recorded it 
and sent over the recording and he said, oh my gosh, you know, the world needs to know about this. So it's amazing that their vocal cavity or something is trying to be able to do this. And so they chant these mantras while they're meditating, three different, I think it's three different notes, all in one person. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Weird in an awesome way. <laughs> weird meaning amazing and <coughs> beautiful. Also, Tibetan Buddhists use mudras, which are hand movements. So instead of the body staying still, as they're chanting and as they're chanting all these various notes, they move their hands as they're chanting, and they're moving in very symbolic, sacred ways, showing beautiful. It almost looks like sign language. Have you ever seen someone do sign language, but like almost in a moving kind of fluid way? <coughs> and so when they're chanting, they're moving. So in this way, they're not shutting down their sight, their sound, or their body. <coughs> also, there's a very different understanding of sexuality within Vajrayana Buddhism, because sexuality in Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism is seen as something that just gets in the way. We don't want to. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to deal with that. In Vajrayana Buddhism, it's seen as another kind of energy that, to harness the energy um, for meditative purposes. And so tantricism has come right out of this. Have you heard of this tantricism? So that's just understanding the energy of sexuality, not for, not for uh, pleasure as much, or bodily pleasure as much as meditative purposes. So in various ways then, Tibetan Buddhists are really different than Theravada and Mahayana Buddhists in terms of not wanting the energies to be sh shut down, but, but raise them up for spiritual purposes. Got it? So those are the major divisions of um, Buddhism. Of course, we know the Dalai Lama. I'll write his, well, he is the, uh, the head of the clergy of Tibetan Buddhists. But all of the clergy there are the, the lamas, and uh, but he's the, the main one, and he goes all over the world, jetting all over the world, and, and talks and writes, and you know, making Tibetan Buddhism much more known than it was in all of the rest of the history of Buddhism. So we're very lucky to know about this. So, what do you think about this tradition? Well, I, I have a question about yes. it. I uh, might be off the subject. I'm sorry. I it's have okay. Been. No okay. sorry. Here it is. <laughs> uh, uh, we Christians, we all believe we're all going to go to heaven and everything, and that's, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us and saved us. Now, <laughs> did he die for them too? Uh, some, are you talking about what Christians believe? Yeah, I know. I mean, so, for these people, some some would say yes, some would say no, some would say I have no idea. Christians have a variety of beliefs yeah, about. Yeah, uh, and then about them, vice versa. <laughs> Do they pray that we go to heaven? I don't know about that. That's I don't a question know either. I mean, it's just I'm just asking. Yeah, I'm that's sorry. a question for Buddhists. Um, my my, I mean, if you're asking this pastor. You yes. know, I'm only one Christian. I, I With the two billion Christians on the planet right, right now, we have a huge, diverse belief there. Um, my feeling is that judgment is not my realm. Yes. That I'm asked to love my neighbor and God and myself. And I think and they that, do the same. And they do. Right, right. And, and, and Jesus said, I have sheep of another flock of which you know nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I go, okay, I have no idea how God... I, yeah. I barely can <laughs> get through my day with that's all right. I gotta get done. Right. But right. um, yeah, that's a mandala. That's beautiful. That's really nice. Thank you. This is from oh yeah. Oh, okay. Look at I that. Yeah. yeah, on the wall where the yeah. I need to get a PowerPoint or a screen up. Going all the way to the dresses. Oh. So they were. Yeah, yeah they, they were on the other the wall. wall. Yeah. 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 yeah, by the dresses. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Um. I was stuck on those genomes looking at the dress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, 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 yeah. In, in our know. scripture, in our Bible, it says, and I'm, I'm sure I'm getting this a little bit wrong and paraphrasing, and I don't know the exact chapter and verse, but it says, just as through one man, meaning Adam, sin came into the world and has affected us all, 
so too, or maybe it even says like even more so, through one other man, meaning Christ, grace is given to us all. Okay, so who did Adam affect? Is it some people or is it everybody? everybody. Okay, according to the theology anyway, theology of Paul, who talks about original sin, that affected everybody. And it says how much more did the did this other man give grace to everybody? So is there scriptural um, argumentation for salvation for all people? Yes. There's also scriptural argumentation that some will be chosen and others will, you know. There's, there's, all, kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff in scripture that makes this very big. But what I believe is that if I can love my kids enough to be that concerned about their safety, regardless of what they do and say and who they are and whatever, um, how much more can God love any of us? And I always think about how a Nazi um, concentration camp, the average stay for a, for a victim in a concentration camp was nine months. Nine months of pure suffering. So if a Nazi could put people in a concentration camp for an average of nine months, could I believe in a God that would allow anybody to suffer for eternity? Not even nine months. Is God crueler than a Nazi? You see that how that kind of explodes our sense of faith there? Mm-hmm. So I, I find it easier to think that somehow you, what's called universal salvation is worked out. Mm-hmm. But can, can I proclaim that with assuredness? Absolutely not. No, I, I only really proclaim salvation for Christians. I'm just wondering. So I only do funerals for Christians, because that's what I can proclaim. I don't know about anything. I don't think any of us do. What I do know is that I have learned a ton Boy. from Buddhism, <laughs> because it doesn't it doesn't contradict my faith. This is a this is a this is a recommendation to meditate to try to find peace within, to try to not let those things in life hook me that could, that could, you know those hooks that we get? I was mm-hmm. talking about the movies that Eric and I saw last time where I was hooked by one, he was hooked by another. You know how some days you're more hooked than others? Some days you can just let things go and others you can't. That all takes a lot of introspection to try to figure out. Why am I hooked? What's going on? Actually, an interesting thing I have found, and Jack, I want to know what you think about this too as I'm calling you out on this. I have found when I meditate, I find it easier and more enjoyable if I start when I'm in a bad mood than when I'm in a good mood. Here's the reason. When I'm in a good mood and I start meditating, I can't tell the difference between feeling great and feeling great. But when I'm like worried about something and I'm hooked on something, I don't know who cares what it is, something or other. When I go and meditate and I go, I'm gonna let that go. There's a huge distinction between being all wrapped up in something and being totally peaceful because I've decided to let it go. And so I can feel like, oh wow, like a sense of massive relief. That's what meditation is, letting go. It is. Living in the present. It is. Mm-hmm. It's just deciding to let go. And for me, I can feel more of a different. It's kind of like, you know when you're sick and then you feel better? Yeah. You know, you've been feeling better all along and kind of taking that for granted. But when you're sick, you're like, oh, thank goodness. Now I, now I know what it feels like to feel better. And so mm-hmm. it's kind of like when I'm all worked up and then I meditate and I decide almost immediately when I start meditating, I'm letting that go. There's a, oh my gosh, thank you. There's a sense of relief. I've put that down. And what I've learned in meditation is the most important thing is to feel good. Not to be right about this dumb issue that's got me all worked up. It's generally not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth it. We all get worked up. But when we realize I can, I have the power to let that go. I've done it 500 million times. When I meditate or when I, when I, like, if I'm going to be preaching or teaching or doing something publicly, it doesn't matter what I'm worked up about. I have to let it go. 
you, get, you can't, I couldn't be a teacher and be all concerned about, you know, who's going to pay the light bill at the same time, or my dumb brother-in-law who said this offensive thing, or, you know, you know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't function like that. So I know you guys know what I'm talking about. You mm -hmm. at times have let things go on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. You've said, I'm not going to deal anymore. I'm just going to, not, not my crazy party, I'm not going to attend. And you drew a line in the sand, a boundary, and you said they can freak out, or that problem will be there when I get back, or whatever. But I'm gonna go do this thing. And when we do that, we realize how much power we have in our mind. Yeah. We really do. There's a huge, huge yes. connection between this and this. Yeah, yeah. Huge. And we and a lot of times when we're suffering, it's because we keep allowing it. Mm -hmm. We have a high tolerance for our own suffering. Or and we, so we just let ourselves keep suffering instead of letting it go. And aren't, don't, isn't there a, a human way that makes it that, well, if I'm suffering, I'm paying my dues or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we have a huge, yeah, huge thing to think, well, I have to suffer, I'm not going to get better almost. Yeah, whatever. as if suffering could, it's kind of yeah. like if, um, would cure what the problem is. Twitter. Right, it's kind of like if there's if there's hunger in the world, and and I say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be hungry to make them better. What? Why right. would my hunger make anybody better? Right. Or or if, if people were sick, and and I say, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and get sick too, so that they'll get well. It doesn't work that way. And so there, yeah, there's no dues to pay. There just doesn't happen. Right. And and the and the happier we are, the more peaceful we are, the more centered we are, the more in Christian language, aligned with God we are, the better we are for everybody else anyway, the more joyful we are, the more we take care of ourselves, the, you know? That's why I meditate every day. I mean, for one thing, I, don't, I wouldn't like being a person without it, but I certainly couldn't be a pastor without it. I, I couldn't do it. I'd be too off-center. And I'd be off-center trying to help other people get centered. Hardest thing, I think, in meditating is doing it. Yeah. You just stop and do it. You know. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't say I'm going to do it at 7 a.m. as soon as I wake up. You just do it. You know what I mean? And I look forward to doing it because yeah. I'm out of it. Um, I do too. Uh, much peaceful, much more peaceful. Uh, yep. yep. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't feel very good when you first start. I guess it's probably like starting any habit, it feels awkward and weird and whatever, but then when you get used to it, it doesn't take long at all to realize, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do it in the morning because I often just start running throughout the day and I, I get too busy and caught up and stuff, but it's, it's awesome. I can't say enough good things about it. So what's the wisdom for Buddhism for the rest of us who might not be Buddhists but might learn from some of this, any of this? What stands out to you in your life? I would say it's the balance, balancing mm -hmm. act, <laughs> mm -hmm. not act, but, but that, you know, the calm, yeah. peaceful, you know, not going too crazy yeah. in any direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep, exactly. Yeah, good. Anybody else? Um, I think that they see us in that, well, we're all right, we just haven't got to the, where they are. Jesus is believed by Buddhists to be an enlightened man. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's that, for sure. Yeah, an absolute enlightened man. Yeah. And I know yeah. since I'm doing that 365 days in the Bible, yeah. um, we're in Proverbs, right? <coughs> and that eightfold half, uh -huh. eightfold half, is that what it's Yes. Mm -hmm. It's so much of problem. That's yeah. true. It is. Yeah. What stands out to you about the path that's similar to the Proverbs? It just well, it's <coughs> like, it, it, the the Proverbs are kind of like do this to get your wisdom, and, and if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen to you. And it's almost like in this path, so you have to have the right this, this, and this. And if you don't, yes, then you're going to be stuck somewhere else. With yes, you all that in your dukkha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To me, as a Christian, I think of things in terms of two aspects. One is a salvation issue, and then there's everything else. So as a Christian, I don't believe any of us has to do with salvation. 
I, I believe, this isn't a Buddhist thought, but I believe that salvation was a gift given to us on the cross, that ultimate healing, we'll all be with God forever, we're good. But there's so much we can do to enhance our lives, you know, to, to feel more centered, more peaceful, more joyful, more loving. I mean, there's so much we can do. And yet, and, and we all know that, but most of the advice we hear is from social media or, I don't know, television or giving us advice that might not actually be helpful. It might be more of the same. Just keep going after more material things, more consumerism, or or more um, greed, or more personal if you, power. If you have enough wrinkles, you'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're, we're getting all kinds of advice, but it might not be really helpful. And so this is advice that's like, yeah, do these things. And like Proverbs, you know, watch your speech and, and watch your intention and watch your uh, morality and all those things. Those are, from my belief, not salvation issues. It's not that we're doing this to earn ultimate acceptance from God, love from God, salvation from God. That's a done deal. That was done on the cross. Jesus hung there and said, it is finished. And it is. But these are things that just help us have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. And we know that. We know when we use our words improperly, we're going to cause problems and rifts in a relationship, which then we have to apologize for and, you know, work things out, whatever. We know that it's better when we have good intentions and then when we're more focused and more mindful with one another and not distracted all the time and trying to do a million things. We know that those of us that meditate, that meditation is helpful. I mean, we, we know that we can get to a place where we're not quite as hooked by those things. I mean, I see, I see my kids go through school, and I go, oh, yeah, I remember the drama of those days. Remember when everything hooked us? Mm -hmm. When somebody looked at you funny, and you're like, oh, they don't like me, and everything was drama. And yet, you move through the decades, and you're able to go, I'm going to release that. I'm not going to play that game, and yeah, that's, you know, whatever. You can have those thoughts, but I'm not going to participate. You know, you get a little bit more distance. And so these are just these things that help us have that kind of quality of life so we're not hooked so much by other people's stuff, and even our own stuff. We can learn to observe even our own stuff or crazy voices in our heads, you know, yeah. and say, oh, there goes my freaking out voice, but I don't have to take counsel from that. I don't have to believe that. I have that. Go have a nap. You'll feel so much better, you know, or whatever. That does help a lot. Yeah, it Being does. Being tired is it. It does. Yeah. Being tired, it's like you're mentally disturbed at that point, yeah. and you might as well just take a nap. Or if it's in the middle of the day, go get some coffee or something. I don't know. Work it out. So you <laughs> say when you meditate, you have all these other thoughts coming into your mind. Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, really does. I have tried to meditate. I cannot meditate. I have all these thoughts, like you say, ooh, 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 ooh. That's totally And I'm going, I'm going, I gotta, I gotta stop this. I gotta stop. But that's... What, what should I meditate on? You know, and I think, well, God, I'm gonna meditate on you. I'm just gonna, about you on the cross. I'm just gonna do that. Then, by golly, here comes something else. It always oh, will. Like a road. Here's, here's the key. Do, do. Here's the key. You've got to make peace with the fact that that will always happen. You're not you do. doing it wrong. That's exactly what happens. It exactly. happened to me this morning. It's a, nobody, nobody grows out of that. At least I don't know anybody that grows out of that. I certainly haven't grown out of that. So you meditate on something relatively boring. So like your breath. Uh-huh or the sound of the air conditioner or something that you hear. Or you can look at like a candle flame or something, but I would get too distracted if my eyes were open. So you meditate on something relatively boring, and at first, I'm telling you, you will only be distracted. It's okay. okay. Right. 15 minutes into it, if you can hang on, that's the thing, hang on. 15 minutes into being distracted, most of the apps have bells that you can yeah like every five yeah. minutes is what I do. I That's do 20 true. minutes to a half an hour. Yep. A bell every five minutes, so you don't start thinking how long have I been going. So it. you're using an app on your that. phone. Yeah. There's a good app called I think it's Headspace. Yeah. That helps. There's some good apps that really help. Oak is another really good one. Yeah. If you do, if you do an app on your phone, I don't, but there I know some people that love them. Um, I listen to the air conditioner and I can kind of tell when it's about 20 minutes because I've just done it a lot. But 
If I open my eyes and it's only been 10, I'll close my eyes and keep going. It's not that big of a deal. But I've had to make peace with the fact that I'm constantly distracted. And you just keep going back to your breath and back to your breath. And I, for me, I say a prayer. This is the prayer, two words, reveal yourself. And I go back to my breath and sometimes I say it again, reveal yourself. Then I, 15 minutes into this, either see something that I don't really see with my, my eyes are shut. Uh -huh. But it's like I can kind of see with my mind's eye uh -huh. something, or an idea will come to me, or a person to call, or something. This happens four out of five times. One out of five times, nothing happens. And I go, okay, well, move on with my day. Four out of five times, something is given to me that is not from me. I didn't originate the thought. I'm now almost asleep enough to receive. I've stopped all my resistant thought, and I'm just listening to the air conditioner or whatever. But I'm telling you, this doesn't happen until around 15 minutes in. I see. So, but in the last five minutes, it's just oh, it's comforting, it's wonderful. Sometimes I see the figure of Jesus, and then I talk to Jesus. And people could say, you know, you're insane, you're making it all up, fine, whatever. I just, okay. <laughs> but I just know the effects on my life are really, really, really huge. I'm an impatient man, so that's why I can't never stay that long. Well, hours. I didn't start out at 20 minutes. I started at like two, I know you three, five. I started my at My wife slow. tried to help me. She's tried. <laughs> hey, uh, if, don't, don't fight it. If you can't stand it, don't do it. It's okay. Read the Bible. I would so like much. to do it. I would like to. Then you can. To have that. Then I you can. Really like to have that. You can. I'll Stop fighting you. yourself. <laughs> that, that says it's going to help me. I, I can download some guided oh, meditations, good. and that'll, be good. that'll help to start. You know, yeah. just five yeah. minutes of and guided he, meditation. He just has that hard time of. Everybody does. Everybody yeah. does. It's Everybody true, does. but. You know, Ben's but, no different than I was when I first started. Yeah. No, but but he. Well, I guess I'm it different. It doesn't get because, it doesn't get easier. No, you just get used you to are, it being. You just get used to it being annoying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just feel I'm missing something. You're not. I am. I mean, You're yeah. not. It's like ice cream being passed out and I, I'm behind the and door and can't get it. You're not missing anything. You're doing it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to try. I try. Jack will help me. Jack will help you. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Jack always helps me. And start out small. Start out two, three minutes. Yes. Five minutes is a good start. Two, three minutes, you're going to be distracted the whole time. You might. What I found, because I started small too, and what I found in my meditation when I did five minutes or ten minutes, well, it started up probably five minutes I started, it felt like a hundred million years. I was constantly distracted. Nothing happened during meditation. But then when it was done, I would come out of it feeling clearer. It's almost like you had a nap. Yes. Yes. Like you had a nap. Like you woke up from this yes. wonderful nap. So even in five minutes, there were benefits. They, it was not during the meditation, it was after the meditation that there were benefits. And then you just go a little bit longer. It's like, I used to run, I don't run anymore, I just walk a lot, but running, you can't start out running like, you know, 10 miles. Nobody, it would be insane to do that. You just do a little bit, and then you do a little bit more, you do a little bit more, you're patient with yourself, and just keep extending it a little bit more. I've meditated for like 20 years, so it's no big deal to do 20 minutes. But in the beginning, I could never have done that. I would have gone crazy, just do five. And you'll feel like you had an app. I'll try it, I'll try it again, and and I'll the, try it before. The thing is, it when you do this, and you're constantly distracted, just keep coming back to, like say if it's your breath, and you're gonna go thinking of something else, just gently go back to just listening to or feeling breath come in and out of your nose. And then you'll go off somewhere else, come back. You're, you're building a muscle of mindfulness. Okay? And All right, I'll do it. try to avoid beating yourself up though, because you're not doing anything wrong. It's exactly what happens to everybody. So anyway, yeah, go try this at home. It's fun. Although it's totally infuriating at first, and just be okay with that. 
make friends with the infuriating. <laughs> but eventually you'll see that it gives you some real benefits. You learn a lot. Like Ben notices whenever I go to his house, he took notice that I don't get out of the car. I start to get out and I just sit there and look around and take in, you know, it's yeah. a form of meditation. It you're, is. You're, you're being in the now. You're yes. seeing the bush that you never saw before. Yes. You know, the, the curtains. Uh, yeah, very good at not seeing. Yeah, and, uh, but you, I do it all the time, you know, I'm yeah. just not in a rush, and it's, it's what I call a two-minute meditation. Yeah. You know, just a yeah. I send my dog out to get him. Yeah. <laughs> there's something wrong. I go, Dixie, go I'm get that. We're going to get him. Well, I hope you can all go to Shilai Temple on, hopefully it's July 27th that we get that date. Um, when you're there, it's like you're in a walking meditation. Really. Well, it's, I'm going to go there. I want to see it. It's amazing. It touches your spirit. It really does. It's an amazing place. So I hope you can go. So anyway, we are over time now, but thank you so much. Thank we you. will talk next Wednesday on um, Confucianism, the Chinese religion. Oh, that still is very much alive and well in China, even though religion officially is outlawed. Yeah. But it's part of the people, and it's not going anywhere. So it's a really interesting religion to study. So wow. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. <clears throat>